Welcome to the Everyday Board Game Podcast with Daniel and Daniel. And today we have a special guest joining us from Stonemeyer Games. We have the man himself, Jamie Stegmeyer. Hey, thanks for having me. And so this is our weekly board game breakdown uh, segment where we go over the entire back catalog of, of a publisher or a designer and all the games that they've created. And we break down. Um, we're going to go into the full details um, after Jamie leaves and we'll go through our standard. We're going through every Board Game Geek web page of it. Mm-hmm. But since we have you on, we wanted to ask you some questions and talk to you just about the industry as a whole and about com- the company Stonemeyer Games. I'm happy to answer any, any questions you have. <laughs> awesome. So uh, do you want to get started? Yes. Uh, so one of the first questions I have, uh, mainly it goes to Wingspan, is are you shocked of how well that game just blew up the way it did? I, I, I'm pleasant, I'll say pleasantly surprised. <laughs> um, I, I love the game. I was very involved in the development of it. Uh, but Elizabeth did an amazing, amazing job with the design, yeah. and I loved it. I knew I was going to play it a lot, and I figured a decent number of people would play it and enjoy it if they gave it a try. But I really didn't know, especially with that first printing, I didn't know how many hobby gamers would uh, give it a try in the first place. And so I'm fortunate that they did. There was some good buzz from the beginning that made us want to reprint more and more right away. But yeah, it's uh, I, I, I never thought, like, that by the end of this year, we will have sold 500,000 copies of Wingspan. Wow. I never thought we would sell that many copies of any game, even a very successful game. So it is beyond my, well beyond my expectations. Is it so far the best-selling of the Stone Mile? It is. It recently outsold Scythe. Scythe was up over 300,000 units, but Wingspan kind of jumped past it with some big print runs recently. Right. Yeah, no, so I, I was amazed the way that game, especially... Um, my uncle got me into birding. Uh, he's a real big bird watcher, oh, and cool. I started going with him every now and then. And when I saw this, I'm like, okay, that's an interesting theme. And then I just did not expect it to blow up the way it did, honestly. Yeah. And it, among gamers and among uh, uh, the birding community, people yeah. who love, who, like, like uh, and right. people in your family who, who, love, who love birds, that's... Uh, I don't know how many of them actually end up playing the game, but I hope it's a fair number. We've tried to make it as accessible as yeah. possible to non-gamers. Right, and what makes it interesting is because so it, I wouldn't say that it's a light game. Um, it it's not difficult for gamers, of course. Uh, like it, it's like what medium weight if we had to put a weight to it. Um, but yeah. what makes it interesting is that uh, going that approach of just such a unique theme and the background of it, I, I feel was was definitely in its favor. Um, was that part of the idea behind Wingspan before you went into it was we don't want to do the same old like, oh, well, I'm just collecting weapons for a medieval... Tra- I, I don't even know if that was one of them. But you know what I mean. It, we don't want to do the same tried and true uh, themes. Was that one of the mindsets behind it? Well, I would say from Eliz- Elizabeth's perspective, she pitched the game to us and it, it was a, a bird-themed game from the beginning, from her perspective. Okay. Uh, and she definitely wanted something different. She she wanted a theme that she really enjoyed and that was different than what she was seeing in the hobby, especially among medium-weight games. Um, from our perspective, we're, we're always looking for something innovative, whether it's a different component that hasn't been in a game or hasn't been used in a certain way, a different theme or different twist on a theme, different mechanism, different twist on a mechanism. So while we weren't looking for birding in, in particular, we were looking for something different. Right. And when Elizabeth pitched it to us right away, we saw not only is it different, but she's done a great job at mixing the theme of each individual bird with the mechanisms that she puts on those birds. That's awesome. Nice. Now, I want to yeah. I want to focus on you as the designer now. Um, let, let's talk yeah. about how Stonemeyer became a company, um, because... Yeah. Of course, a lot of comp- a lot of designers could just pitch, you know, to to other publishers. What made you decide to to be your own businessman? Well, I, I mean, Kickstarter is no longer a part of what we do at Stomara Games. But before our first Kickstarter in 2012, I was enamored with the platform. I, I just, and I still am as a backer. But I love the idea that I could. Uh, run a business and, and bring something to life. And while I'm doing that, I'm engaging with a ton of people directly who support the product. That was just an awesome concept to me. And I, I really enjoyed backing projects before I ran one. And so I really, I designed Viticulture specifically so that I could put it on Kickstarter and have that Kickstarter creator experience yeah. alongside of Viticulture. Um, I, I didn't even think uh, to go to a publisher with it because I kind of wanted to be the publisher for it. I was interested in the business side of it as well as the design side. 
That's awesome. Were, nice. were you a businessman in by by trait beforehand, or? I was a wannabe businessman. I, I had I had worked in the business industry, but uh, for other people up to that point, um, both for a uh, medical textbook publishing company and then as a director of operations at a nonprofit facility in St. Louis. Um, so I had dabbled in it, but not as running my own show. Um, I, I was always excited by that idea, and I, I got to do it with with that Kickstarter and and then with Stillmeyer Games. Okay, fantastic. So one of my questions yeah. going along with that, when you're making your own games, is what comes first to you? Is it the theme or the mechanism that you want to add on to the theme, or is it just like a combination? It, usually, it start like the idea, the very basic, you know, the the. 10, 10 word idea is one or the other. It, it, it for it's been both of them for me. It's also even been the the art like for Sai that started with me seeing a few of the illustrations that Jakob had made, and I was just like, wow, I, this art is beautiful. I want this art in a game, and I want this world in a game. Um, but it goes both ways. But from the very beginning, when I'm doing pencil and paper brainstorming, the the mechanism, whatever the mechanism is, immediately I'm looking for a theme for it. Or if it's a theme, immediately I'm looking for mechanisms that fit it, and I go back and forth right away. So it becomes after that initial idea, it, it everything is muddled together right away. Okay, very cool. Yeah, awesome. Um, so now that you've you've talked a lot, I, I'm a aspiring designer myself, and oh. I watch a lot of your design cool. videos and a lot of the, the industry background, which has been very valuable to me. And in a lot of them, you brought up the fact that you were a Magic player and still are uh, yeah, quite yeah. an avid Magic the Gathering player. Uh, I used to play when I was a young teenager, and I, I still, because of you, I bought a couple new sets. Um, so, <laughs> no, no offense, but no, uh, have have you ever thought about using like um, like magic or a collectible card game style in any of your designs, or do you feel like that's already long fulfilled? Uh, like, I, I see a lot of like uh, I. Uh, Isaac Vega is the first one that comes to my mind. I know he was a Magic player long before he went into independent game design, and then he created Ashes, um, which was like a Magic-inspired game. Have you ever yeah. felt uh, inspiration from Magic or any other games like that? Well, there's two, two different sides to that question. One is, have I been inspired by it and absolutely all the time? That's, I mean, I love Magic, and so I continue to play for that reason, but every time a new set comes out... I, I learned so much from the new mechanisms, the, the new cycles of cards. There's just so much amazing design in every set of Magic. Um, and one of the, that's actually one of the things I've been missing the most due to this pandemic. I, I bought right. uh, like the mystery boosters. I bought those for a draft and scheduled the draft. And then the pandemic, I still mm. have like a whole, a whole draft's worth in my cabinet over here that I want to play with. But uh, the other side of that question is, would I design like a Magic-like game, like a CCG? I probably wouldn't do a CCG. I am dabbling in something around like an expandable LCG okay. format. Okay. It might just end up being a deck-building game or a bag-building game, but uh, but if it ends up fitting well with that format, I might explore it. Yeah. Do, are you guys into any LCGs? I've just recently myself got into uh, uh, Keyforge. Keyforge. Mm -hmm. But Keyboard. before yeah, that, yeah. I've been playing a lot of solo of the Arkham Horror, the card game. I really enjoy that yeah. one. Yeah, I myself, yeah. I, I started with Magic, and but when I was younger, um, I, I you know I played Pokemon, and I played Tomb Raider, the collectible card game, which was a bizarre one. I like that one a lot. But um, ever nowadays, every time I see like a defunct, uh, like like anachronism, I know is one of them, or like any mm -hmm. different collectible card games i just got the looney tune starter set and found out that it was made by james okay. Ernest. it's like wow you know so like a, a lot of these guys who are in, now in the industry of non-collectible games started there like mike elliott eric lang it, it's it's oh, a yeah. bizarre idea you know <laughs> and that's it, it's interesting to see that evolution but that's that's where i i, I liked it but i've seen a lot of we, we have a term uh in our group we call them magic butts you know like uh -huh. and i'm sure you've heard that that term before uh, it's like let me tell you about this game it's like magic but but right but right. yeah and then but it has this change and so whenever we say that, it's like well but we like magic so why play right. anything else right um right so that's that's an interesting take on that very cool um another you mentioned it earlier about the pandemic i know you have another game that you're not ready to talk about yet but it's going to be coming out later this year how has this really affected the play testing for your games that are upcoming yeah. Uh, so we, we started out, I mean, fortunately, well, not fortunately, there's nothing good about the pandemic, yeah. but 
Right. Uh, we for like maybe a month, the first month of it, we didn't really have it. We were in between playtests, so we didn't have much going on. And then we started to have stuff that we needed to playtest: expansions, um, a, a couple new games, and uh, fortunately, we have a great group of blind playtesters, people around the world who at least many of them have either a partner that they could play with or their families that they could play with. So we were able to get some blind play tests, a decent number of blind play tests in. But for me, I just have my girlfriend here and I, she's she's very much a gamer. She's happy to play test, but I don't want to, you know, there's a difference between personal and business. I don't want to cross yeah. that line too much with her. So I do it a little bit. Um, so we tried doing it on Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator and we did a little bit, but it's, I don't know if you guys have played games on there. Awesome no. platforms. Mm -hmm. The physics engines there is incredible. Right. But it's not the same. It, right? it takes almost. It's not the same. Yeah, it takes so much more time, and I, I need that mental energy when I'm playtesting to focus on the playtest and what I need to learn from the playtest. Not like how do I flip over this card yeah. or how do I like orient this cube the right way because I'm holding the mouse and yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's been tough, but we are going to try. Actually, this week is the first time that Joe, my coworker, is going to come over. Uh, both of us have been really good about self isolating. We're both going to wear a mask while we do it, and we're going to have. A little play test. We're gonna give it a try and see how it goes. If it doesn't work out, hopefully we don't get sick or anything. I think we've been good about it. I don't think there's that's the risk. But right. overall, it has been rough. It it has been tough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, has has yeah. it seen? Have you seen effects on uh, not just so much play testing, but everything else? Uh, sales, the company, like how how's it affecting you? Um, on some levels, it uh, I, I've been kind of lucky. I mentioned earlier that I work from home. So I'm used to being in my home all day for, for everything. Um, so that, that, that part is, is normal and fine. We have also seen our direct um, online, store order, online store orders go way up. Uh, oh. I think a lot more people were ordering directly because they couldn't go to their local game store, which is nice in the, in the short term, but most of our sales are through distributors and retailers. And so I'm glad to see that people have kind of uh, started to move back. To, uh, we're open pretty quickly to like curbside pickup and things like that, and, yeah. and those retailers pivoted. So that's been okay. Uh, my biggest concern is what the holiday season will look like this this year. That's yeah. usually a huge sales period for us and retailers, and um, I think we probably haven't seen the full economic impact on this on people's wallets yet. Like in the short term, people were looking for entertainment some, and things to do at home. Right. Yeah. In the long term, people are looking to put food on their tables, yeah. and so I think we'll see that. How, how are you guys holding up? In those regards. doing pretty well um luckily we live in a state that i mean it's it's there but it's not we don't live like in a massive city and um yeah. we've taken precautions when it was growing early enough yeah. this is the only time we actually get together is when we're yeah. live like this um and it's usually when we have guests but it's been it's been interesting because i miss going to uh, the local shop game night and stuff like mm -hmm. that and play testing and my wife doesn't play a lot of board games and as you can see i got a plethora of them behind me <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, I, and I'm kind of saying that's actually so. Once again, we're going to thank you for coming on this because this was the re the pandemic was on unfortunately the cause of this podcast. You know, we're fairly new, and and the whole reason why we wanted to do this is we wanted to have an entertainment value and a direct interaction with anybody who could join us. Yeah. Um. You know, so I started yeah. the Twitch channel, and and then we started the podcast shortly after, yeah. and that's it's been in it's been valuable. And then, but on the game design aspect, um, I found like, and I, and I want to know if this is the same for you. Um, I normally come up with about, you know, one or two ideas you know, like every month or so, but ever since I've been at home all day, you know, but not by choice, but I, I've since like came up with so many countless prototypes and who knows how far they'll go, but like really yeah. it was an influx in my creative background. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. That's that's awesome. Oh. Yeah, that has been... Uh, I have had more time for that as well. Yeah. I've, I've even done some playtests against myself. Have you done any of those where you have like a oh, yeah. two-player playtest where you're wait. playing both players? Yes, I love, I love yeah. doing that. The hardest one is bluffing, playing in that game. It's like, mm, I'm going to bluff you. It's like, well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking right at... And like having that internal conversation, like, what am I doing right now? Yeah, for me, what I've been doing is learning all my games that were on my shelf of shame just as a two-player game this way. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah, since yeah. evolved. I, I now have my shelf of shame evolved into a stack of potential of games that I've read oh, the rules and I know how to play. I'm just waiting for my kids to... Yeah, anyway. Um, it, it's really silly. Uh, nice. So I'm going to rewind a little bit. So you were, uh, your company was kind of like one of the big innovators in like Kickstarter. And, and like, I mean, you, you certainly weren't the first and you're, and you're not the last either. But 
one of the things that you did differently and and correct me if i'm wrong is that you were you were incredibly open to the backers and you were huge about communication and letting not just uh the customers and the consumers uh, the gamers buying these games know exactly how the process is working but you were also huge into promoting that idea and that and that style amongst other board game publishers um sure how do you view your role in the industry back then and nowadays? It's a very deep question. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean to catch question. off guard. Um, I, I, let's see. How can I answer that? So part of it is, and I think part of what you're referring to is that I write a blog a couple times yeah. a week yeah. where I talk about running a business, entrepreneurship, crowdfunding is one of the big topics that comes up. Um, and uh, the reason I started writing that back in 2012 was that nothing like it really existed at that point. Yep. Um, and I wanted, I, I kind of had to stumble my own way through my, my first uh, Viticulture Kickstarter campaign. And so I wanted to put all the things that I had learned, all the mistakes I had made. I made so many mistakes. I, I will continue to make mistakes. And I like sharing them so people don't have to make the same mistakes that I made. Right. Um, and that feels good to me. That just feels right. And I also, it's also helpful for me because I process things best in writing. So I get to write this down. I even refer back to some of my old blog posts from time to time to say, you know, how should I do this? How can I, what was I thinking when I wrote this? Um, and in terms of other publishers, the way I, I, I prefer to lead is by example. So I, I try to put this stuff out here and show like one way of doing it. And if other people want to follow, if they like that, then they can. If they want to try a different way, they can too. And one of the early things, the things that I kind of regret a little bit is that in some of those early blog posts, I use the word should a lot. I would say, you should do this. You should not have exclusives. Mm -hmm. You should not have early birds. Um, and I've kind of, I really moved away from using that word because that's just my opinion. If, if someone thinks that exclusives are great for them, go for it. Um, rather, I can talk about my own experience, what I've enjoyed both as a creator, as a backer, and if other creators want to, uh, want to use those same techniques, that's totally up to them. That's so I try to be less, I guess, pushy with my advice and more say, say, this is what we do. Do what you want. This is one way to do it. Here's some facts around how this worked out. Here's a story right. about how this worked out. Right. Uh, well, I, I see like like how you're doing this. And, and uh, I think what, what ultimately occurs, and I don't know if you're noticing it as well, but it seems like more publishers are willing to take that risk of doing a first-time Kickstarter. And they're not seeing it as so much like a, a hindrance, but more of like a hey, we've been aspiring to do something this big and this is the way we can do it. And, and clearly companies like your own are like have shown how it works and how to be successful at it. Like, so we're, we're just talking briefly, we had Justin on uh, a couple hours ago for one of our interviews. And so he's doing the very first Kickstarter he's ever done for Castle Panic. Um, last mm -hmm. week we had uh, Kurt Covert of Smirk and Dagger and, and he's doing his first Kickstarter, or no, uh, second Kickstarter uh, tomorrow it starts, and then oh, cool. yeah, and then we've also had uh, Level Ninety Nine, who's a huge Kickstarter-based board game company yeah. on as well. So it it it's yeah. it's interesting to see how how all of these design topics because I haven't heard anybody else really talk about uh, Kickstarter uh, as a as a business model quite to your degree. Um, what, to but to expand on that, do you feel like it was a big? Uh, it was almost like bittersweet to stop doing Kickstarter? I still, I still certainly miss it from time to time. At, at the time in, in the summer of uh, what 2016, when I decided that we were going to try to not use it for a while, right? um, it felt definitely right. It, it felt good. There was a sense of relief at the time um, to try a different way. Uh, but, but I do look back at Kickstarter from time to time. I even had a blog post last year that was like, what if, what if I did one again? What if I went back and did it? Because I miss it, it's exciting. It's, it's a lot of fun to do. Um, that creative energy uh, is just amazing. Yeah. Our method now, of course, is that we just, we have all that creative energy a little more privately and then we make the product and then we get that sense of excitement when we announce it and then we ship the games almost right away. So it's like ready to go as we're talking about it, as we're announcing it. And that is a different type of excitement. But that creative energy around the uh, about yeah. building something together with people that wouldn't exist without them, it's incomparable. I I, I, yeah. I miss it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know the, about that creativity and announcing it right when it's ready to sh ship. Because I used to be on graveyards for the longest time, and I remember having to be up at eight o'clock this way I can pre-order tapestry. Oh, it's okay. like, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so I have a kind of not so deep question that you've been getting from Sorry. this guy over here, but My it's uh, <laughs> what what game uh, do you feel should have gotten more love and hope it gets more love down the line uh, out of yours? Out of our games, oh okay. yeah. yeah. I was gonna go deep into another publisher's games, <laughs> um, but uh, out of our, uh, you know, the one that continues to surprise me, and I'm hoping we are working on an expansion for it that I hope will bring it back to people's. Um, uh, bring it back to people's tables a little bit, is uh, Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. I love Castles of Mad King Ludwig. I love the the competitive, cooperative aspect of the Between Two model. And that game, I thought I, I thought it was a no-brainer, but yeah. uh, it didn't sell nearly as well as we thought as we thought it would. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys played that one? I have. I played Between Two Cities. I haven't played Mad, uh, Mad King Ludwig one. Uh, I want to, I just haven't got it. Right. And same here. I, I Well, I haven't played Between Two Cities. I played Castles of Mad King Ludwig. <laughs> So I haven't okay. played the, the culmination of it. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that aspect and that puzzle aspect where you're like, well, this is going to become really, really important to me, but do I want to play it over here? Because right. which, which one? Which one's going to score better for me? Yeah. Well, if I, you ever want to do a Twitch stream of it or something, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to send you a copy. It does work best from th three plus, okay. but it does have a two-player variant that you could play if it's just the two of you. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, we'll be t in talks after this. Um, <laughs> so I, I've played... Uh, I'm going to try and be as non-spoilery as possible, and I think you already know where I'm going to go with this. Uh, Daniel has not finished the campaign yet. I have. Um, and I have a great story that I'm going to bring up here in a minute uh, for Charterstone. Okay. And okay. and a good friend of mine, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Trevor, yep. um he he hated the idea or just the pure concept of legacy games is like if any part of it is consumable i don't like it like so like and and i remember i was like all right here here's the deal if i buy a legacy game and i and i bring you over will you at least give it a shot like i'm i have all the okay. money invested in it you know that's i i've already liked legacy games i'm if it says legacy i'll probably do it and so that was our deal and then after okay. at the very end of the first game uh he sat back and he was like, I fought this guy tooth and nail <laughs> for months <laughs> over that. And, and so you sold him on it. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Let, without, being, without giving out too much spoilers, uh, first off, some of the things that you did with it um, where, how do I, I'm going to word this in a way that does not give anything away. But like, I, I enjoyed seeing other people's reactions to the game as well. Um, and, and I think that like, like one of my favorite things after each game is like, oh, how did you do? You know, like I, I loved seeing that. Um, yeah. Which, um, and I think you know what I'm talking about specifically. That there was some really strange and unique innovations in this legacy game that I haven't seen anywhere else, and I probably won't. Um, what were some of the other ideas that you considered while making a, a legacy game, or what was what was the reasoning for it? Um. Yeah, I went through a lot of different ideas for it. I'm trying to think of something interesting that I cut um, yeah. that is legacy-related. Yeah. Well, okay, so two quick things. One is originally everything um, everything was going to be in its own envelope. So the game was going to come okay. with like a hundred different envelopes, and it would have you open. Oh, and wow. so like that concept of crates in the game, the crates were going to be envelopes. Yeah. Yeah. But the downside there, and there's a game that has done this now, the, uh, the uh, what's the King's Dilemma, which I need to play. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's one on my list, too. But that apparently, yeah, it looks awesome. And apparently they have a ton of envelopes in the game. There's a huge labor cost behind doing that. Like, you have yeah. someone who is actually stuffing specific cards in specific envelopes over and over again <laughs> yeah. at, at the factory. Um, so we, it, it, the cost was too high. So we didn't do that. The one other thing that I wanted to do, less legacy related, but I uh, I love the book. Have you read the book uh, Ready Player One? Yes. Or, the, or watched the movie, either one? Yeah, I read the book. Um, so one of the great things about it is that there's this big, giant, it's essentially a treasure hunt. People are, are treasure hunting for these clues that they find, and they're they're trying to get a big big prize. And so at the end of the campaign, I, I wanted to put like a riddle that would... Uh, that would lead people on a treasure hunt to to an actual like substantial amount of money that they could win if they solved a very difficult puzzle. Um, yeah. But ultimately, I decided not to do it. I thought there were too many issues that could come out of it. People might be angry because they didn't find the clue or whatever, right. or they didn't finish the campaign. But I I was enamored by that idea for a while. We didn't end up doing it. 
Right. I, I, I don't blame, I don't know if you were if, if you've heard of um, Mr. Fenn. I don't remember what his first name is. Forrest Fenn, maybe. Uh, he he's a native of uh, our our state. He lives up in Santa Fe, and he hid uh, a treasure uh, somewhere oh, in the mount. This yeah. was found recently, right? Yeah, it was found just like yeah. last week, and yeah, he lives yeah. like a few hour drive from us. And so apparently, so was the spot <laughs> pretty close to <laughs> oh, us. Really? Yeah, oh, wow. yeah. I've I've always loved that idea, and I, I'm glad at least I'm glad people yeah. are doing it. But I, I see what you mean. Like that that's a that's a tricky caveat, you know. I mean, if you do yeah. it, then there's going to be people who only buy the game for that reason, trying to get money or treasure, and and that could cause negative reviews on that part yeah. alone. Yeah. And then uh, going back to Charterstone, I noticed something that you did add to it. I, mind you, I haven't gone through it, but I'm noticing a lot more legacies are doing now is where when you're done with it, you can still play it yes. as a game. And I, for the life of me, I can't think of any other game. I think you really were the first ones that really started that. Oh. Yeah, I think, I mean, some people argue that Gloomhaven is a legacy game. I think it's right on the edge because I yeah. think you can play sure. without making permanent changes. Um, Gloomhaven, if, if you do count it as legacy, it is definitely in that format. But right. yeah, I, I, uh, and I don't even know how many people actually play Charterstone after the after the campaign, but at least you have the option of doing yeah. so. Yeah. You'll be revisiting that village that you built a year later, a couple years later, just for a fun game and to, to reminisce. I like that idea, and I, I, I wonder if we'll start to see that a little bit more too. Because I know Machikor Legacy does it. Yeah, Machikor uh, Legacy does now it. does. Yeah. Um, and now, yeah. yeah, we're seeing more and more Legacy games. Uh, Betrayal Legacy. We uh, what is that, that uh, the card game, the deck builder? Yeah. Uh, Clank Legacy. Uh, Clank. You can play it afterwards. Yeah. Clank does so. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's... Yeah. I love that campaign, by the way. That, I have a blast with Clank Legacy. <laughs> that's one that we haven't yeah. played yet. Yeah, uh, a buddy of ours actually <laughs> got it, and then the pandemic happened, so it's just uh, sitting there. Yeah, yeah it's... it's You're going to have fun with that. They did a great job. Yeah, have you pay, played uh, Betrayal Legacy yet? I have not. That that's uh, that's on the list. Yeah, it, is, if it, you'd is like, it worth playing? Do you have fun? No, we had a blast playing it. It's it's okay. my favorite iteration of it so far. Yeah. Of, oh, cool. of, yeah. So, all right. Um, so I know uh, we're a little strapped for time. We hit the thirty minute mark. Uh, is there anything else, real quick, before we let you go? Uh, we brought up most of the games. Uh, along mm -hmm. your catalog, and we're going to go do a deep dive after we let you go. But uh, is there anything else that you'd like to say about uh, your ga the games as a history? Um, well, I don't know. I, I'm talking to you guys. I, I could share more, of course, but uh, but I'd love to hear if there is there's anything about our games, any any one of our games in particular that you'd love to see a certain element of it done again in the future maybe it's a, a component that we used we've mentioned a few things here today but anything mm -hmm. that you can think of where you're like oh i really like this i wish this was in more games or i wish this this was in a future stonemeyer game uh, i'd love to hear your thoughts on that i i do have an answer ready yes yeah, so do i <laughs> okay go ahead uh, okay my favorite mechanism is worker placement and viticulture is my favorite worker placement game I really love the iteration of the Grande Worker. I just think Grande, where he yeah. just kind of muscles in and allows you to do whatever you <laughs> need to do. I, I love that. And I, I would like to see that in more games. Yeah. Um, cool. My favorite mechanism that I can't honestly... And I'm, I'm curious, I'm going to ask you if there was an inspiration behind it. The, the tracks on Tapestry. I have never seen mm -hmm. that in any other board game of just simply, you just move your piece forward, that's your turn. But that, that has a sleuth of different options that you can do and how you manage it. Uh, was that yeah. that, was that in a game before? The I mean, the, the closest I've seen is Mombasa. Mombasa kind of has, has tracks like that, but it's, I, it's been a while since I played, but I don't think it's the core action system. It's just one of the things that you can do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it, 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 it was inspired partially by A Feast for Odin. Where you have okay. all you have, you know, like sixty-two different worker placement action <laughs> spots and these for Odin, and I wanted a way to have a bunch of different action spots, but not have that overwhelming nature of, of so many. Despite how much I love a piece for Odin, it's just you know it's a little overwhelming to look at sixty-two right. different. Yeah, options. as soon as you bring it out, you're scared. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, example. when you're playing a Juve Rosenberg game, it's just a bunch of different pieces. You're just like, what is going on yeah. here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One more, one more question, if that's all right. Um, yeah, definitely. Who do you consider your favorite designer? I have a top three, um, and this list is starting to change because there, there's so many great designers that are now like there's so many designers that have made like one awesome game that I love, but now those designers are coming out with two, three, four, five games. Um, 
Uh, one of the guys that I'm thinking of in that way is uh, Keith at Thunderworks Games. They do the role player universe. Ah, yeah, I think yeah, I saw yeah. locked up on your shelf back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, right there. And the big box. The, that, I have feeds yeah. of familiar just right under it. Yeah. Nice, nice. He is doing. I mean, he doesn't even design all of his games, but he's doing great work. I think he's going to be on that list someday. But right now, the three that I always think of are Rob Davio. He mentioned Betrayal oh, Legacy. Yeah, yeah. He's yep. the legacy guy. Um, uh, Uwe Rosenberg, who we also just mentioned. And Alexander Pfister, who does uh, uh, Isle of Sky. Yeah. He's one on my radar. Yeah, we'll have to have him on this show one of these days <laughs> if we can. Um, no, that that's awesome. Very cool. So, yeah, that's that's a very diverse background, though. Like, you have a heavy Euro. Well, Pfister is Euro, but as well. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah but he's got a game that I really want to try. Um, I believe Great Western Trail is his. Yeah. And that I want to try yeah, that one yeah. so bad. Oh, and Maracaibo, yeah. Maracaibo more recently, yeah, which yeah. is kind of like a, a different version of Great Western Trail. Yeah. Very cool. And right. Elizabeth Hargrave, honestly, I, I love all the designers we work with. Ben and Matthew, that do the Between Two series. They're awesome. Elizabeth, though, she did Wingspan, and then she did Tussie Mussy, which has like 18 cards, and right. it's still fantastic. So I think she's she will easily be on that list in the future. Yeah, well. one of our she's other awesome. uh, podcasts that we do is the Top 8 Debate, uh, where we debate like different uh-huh. styles of games, and... AEG was on yeah. our list, and I flat out said it's my honorable mention is Mari Postas. I want to play that just because it's so unique and yeah. it looks so good. Yeah, Very cool. it is really good. Yeah, I played an early prototype version of it, and it was it's it, it's light, but it's very pleasantly light, and, and a lot of interesting decisions along the way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not devoid of strategy despite being light. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, it doesn't have to be heavy. Yeah, that's awesome. Right. Well. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been yeah. an absolute pleasure. I wish we could have you on for like hours and hours. Yeah, uh, but that's, it's been an honor. Yeah, no, we appreciate you yeah, joining. Yeah, come back sometime. So. Yeah, thanks sure. for your time. Absolutely. Um, yeah, maybe when when the new game that we cannot talk about <laughs> is coming new, we would love to have you back on. So um, cool. we're we're gonna stick with the podcast right now. We'll take a quick short break uh, okay. to get everything ready, and then we'll go over there. And then I will send you an email later, and we'll send you the link when it's uploaded. Awesome. Thanks, Thank guys. you for your time. Yeah. Do you have Take any care. other sending notes Thanks. that you want to tell our viewers? Oh, oh. I'm healthy. I'm sorry. Um, it, it yeah, join, if, you ever, if you want to join the Stone Games community. Well, okay. can, can you repeat That's that? It, it cut out really bad. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just saying uh, stay safe, stay, stay healthy, and keep having fun with, uh, with games. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful okay. day. You too. All right, welcome back after that quick break. We are going back. We're going to do our board game breakdown, our standard. Uh, we want to give a quick thanks once again to Jamie Stegmeyer for joining us at that interview. That that was wonderful. Very yeah. fun person to talk to. And uh, we're going to go over the we're going to go over all of Stonemeyer's games and do our standard breakdown, starting with the earliest on Board Game Geek. Uh, we do tend to avoid uh, spinoffs or. Or expansions, but we'll still talk about those today. There, there are a couple, but they're actually also standalone games for themselves. Right. Yeah, so we'll be talking about those. <coughs> so, uh, Stonemeyer Games started by Jamie Stegmeyer um, and uh, another person, but he is the president and lead designer. I think it's Alan Stone. Yeah, Alan, I forgive us for not remembering the name off the top of our head. It, but yeah, the Stone. the company name Stonemeyer is a conglomeration of their names. Right, uh, Stone is. The other guy's na- last name, and Jamie Stegmeyer, so it becomes Stonemeyer. Yeah, which makes a lot, which makes perfect sense. And so they they're fairly new to the industry. They started with viticulture, which we'll be getting to in a minute, and they started being a massive industry. Uh, uh, how do I say it? Like just they, they were very influential as far as Kickstarter games go. Uh, they became a juggernaut, really. In all honesty, um, yeah. they. But in a good way. In a good way. They came out small right. and then just took off. And a big, we'll get to the game that really sent them into the stratosphere when it came to because of Kickstarter and stuff like that. But yeah, they really blew up. I want to say 2015, 2016 is when they got really on everybody's radar. Sure, yeah. And then 2019, when we get to it, exploded. Right, yeah. So let, let's let's go ahead and start with the first one. Uh we, so we have the Board Game Geek page, and we have them in order. Uh, if, in case some of them are out of order, uh, that's just because it was how it was listed on Board Game Geek, so we apologize if, if one came out like a few months before the other. Yeah. But uh, So we went ahead and brought that up. Let's talk about Viticulture. That's now pretty much your favorite game. And one top, of them. top two, 
Yeah. Um, so Viticulture is a worker placement game about one of the most unique. I mean, you're seeing more of it now, but unique themes um, at the time about making wine. And you're a vineyard who has their own vineyard and you're competing against other players. Um, and they're um, making these wines and you're trying to compete to get the most points at the end of the game. And what really is interesting to me about it is the way you go about it. You, at the start of the game, you have three workers, especially if you have the essential edition, which is the one you can really find in print nowadays, where you have variable starts. You have the mamas and the papas that tell you you can do this, you can have a little extra money, or you can start with this extra piece that you eventually will have to build anyways. And so what's cool about it is that with your vineyards, you can either plant we or plant vines into them or you can sell them and just get flat money out right away um and so to me uh, it's an interesting take because you start out with so many you can eventually buy some more workers later on but you might want to use that money because you need certain things to build up your vineyards like an irrigation or a trellis to help your vines and stuff like that so to me i really really enjoy this game yeah viticulture is a good fun one um Probably not one of my favorites, but I, I like it. I do appreciate what it does, and and I have enjoyed every time I've played it as well. Yeah. And especially with the, the Essential Edition. And yeah, the and then the, if you get the Tuscany expansion to it, and we don't really talk too much about the expansions, but the reason why I like the Tuscany expansion is two reasons, and one both of them are on the board. Mm -hmm. One, the first reason I like it is it opens up. And if you play the base game of Viticulture, you play within the summer and the winter spring is just you're waking up uh fall is you're getting more cards but then the tuscany expansion with the expanded board you're playing in all the seasons and what makes it so much more interesting is the second thing and that's the wake up track where you have to decide once you retire you take all your pieces on the board which opens up spots for the other players but then you can decide okay where do i want to go in the next round is it really important for me to take the first spot or take the second spot or do I want to go first do I want to hedge my bets and find out who's going to um, want to go ahead of me see where they're playing at or yeah. do I have my system already built and it's quite nice and I, I really like about it because like if you're like oh I'm gonna go here in the seventh spot because it doesn't really matter and I get that extra worker well now you're forced to go to the first spot in the next round and I love that I love that little hey yeah you get a bonus worker but now you have to be the first one to wake up so trying to play that perfectly be like okay I got everything I need I know I'm gonna go first and I'm not gonna get any bonuses off of it but I have set myself up this way I can go first every part of the season yeah yeah, I, I do like the... It, it's almost like a lesson in restraint. Yeah. Like, is you, you have all the workers ready to go at that first season, but if you spend them all that now, you know, next season comes around, you're you not... You got nothing, you're You done. got nothing, yeah. That, that's really interesting to, to weigh that balance. And, Especially when you only have three, and the thing I like about it is you got the Grande worker, too, and I was telling him about it, the Grande worker, where he just muscles his way in. You can be, like most worker placements, depending on the number of players, you can be blocked out of a spot, but that Grande, right. and you really need to get in that spot. You use your grande worker. He allows you to go into that spot even though it's closed out. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's really neat. All right, uh, let's go on to the next one, and that is Euphoria. Now, I did get a chance to play this one. Um, this it's one is, of the few that I have not played. Yeah, and one of the few that I have uh, played that you haven't, <laughs> yeah. I should say. I've I played just about every game. Uh, there, there's one or two that I haven't played of. Of Stone Myers, but this is the first. This is one that I played fairly recently, and it's essentially a dice worker placement game, where you are trying to get resources in different ways. You're trying to fulfill. Uh, I don't want to say orders, but you're fulfilling different contracts of different resources from them, and you're using the the dice pips um, to send out and use them as your workers. What makes it neat is that. The numbers that are on them are effectively how powerful they are. And there's a lot of spaces where if you send too powerful, too many powerful people, well, then you, <laughs> yeah. you have a distinct advantage, but then it also cuts you down well, and, not just and balances that. it out a bit. The workers become too smart and they'd be like, oh, this yeah. is not as uh, utopia as we thought it was. It's more right. of a dystopia, so we're leaving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you lose your workers that way, which is a... A neat little balance of trying to <coughs> find the right amount of workers and also have them not be smart enough to know how bad 
it could be or how much better it could be. So that it was a very interesting game. I did quite enjoy it. Um, I would gladly play it again. And and the board itself is is pretty neat. I'm just gonna see if I can pull up a picture. Yeah, here we go. And um, the the board itself is laid out really really logically, and it it does a really good job of letting you understand. Like if I play something here, it's gonna go up on this track. If I play something here, these are the contracts that I need to fulfill. Um, and it, it's a really neat little resource management game. I want to say, I don't think this is a direct like uh, influence to Charterstone, but I feel like a lot of the a lot of the progression in it makes sense. I can see that. I can see that. Charterstone, yeah. sure. All right, uh, now between two cities, you have played this. I have played this one actually just recently at a um, board game convention uh, last year. Um, I think it was the. It used to be called the Border City Con. I can't remember what the name of it is now. But um, this game, to me, I, I need to own this. I want this one because I really enjoyed it. Because uh, what happens is when you're going through, you're actually working with your neighbors. And I think your lower scored city is what your actual score is going to be. Because you're building two cities. That's why it's right. called Between Two Cities. You're building a city with the person on your left. And you're building a city with the person on your right. So when it's your turn to draft a tile... You're, you're trying to figure out where these two tiles are going to go. Is it going to go into this city or is it going to go into this city? And you're working with your partner to get these. And so it's like, oh, but if I, I want to balance this because at least if I can keep them close to being equal, I don't want to make one really powerful because I'm not going to get the score for it. I need to make sure they're right. both equally powerful this way. So you have to work with both your partners. But mind you, they're also working with partners. So you're trying to negotiate with them to make sure they put the right stuff in the right areas. Right. So I, I, I really dig this. I love the mechanism in it. And uh, Jamie Stegmaier was talking about it. There's a pseudo sequel that we'll talk about in a little bit uh, of this that he wishes had a little bit more love to it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this, this is super intriguing, um, honestly, because I, I've only ever played one game uh, one game that really utilizes that left and right, like you're working with the partners. I, I mean, like I could say Seven Wonders, but that's not really like the warfare. It, yeah, that's. I mean, that's just a technicality. Where, where the and the one I'm talking about is Divinity Derby, where you're taking card, your hands of cards are be are in between the players, not in front of them, and you take one card from each style. Um, but that's just more given information. It's yeah. not. It's not actually utilizing that as a mechanism. This is probably the one that I've been wanting to play the most. In fact, I out of all the ones in the list, other than uh, the sequel to this, between two cities of Ca or between two castles this of Mac and Lou, Ludwig. yeah, um, this is the only one that I I feel bad. He called me out on it. This is the one I haven't played. <laughs> <laughs> I played almost every game in the line, um, you know, with the exception of like My Little Scythe and stuff yeah. like that. But th this is the one I hadn't played, and this is the one I've been wanting to try. And I, I really do enjoy it. It's probably up there as one of my favorite Stone Myers. And I only played it that one time. I just love that puzzle aspect yeah. where you're trying to work with someone on your left and you're trying to work with someone on your right and trying to make your your castles uh, or cities in this case equal. Yeah. No, it, it looks phenomenal. I can't wait to try it one of these days. So you'll and, just have to buy it and then I'll play it. Yeah, I'll try to get it. <laughs> so the next one on our list is the first big boy uh, uh, yeah. Culture was big, but he had to work it a couple times to get it proper with the, the Essentials Edition and stuff like that. Right. But this is the big boy, and as we were talking with him earlier, he said the artwork is what inspired the game for right. this. So that, that is pretty interesting, and this one is Scythe. Yeah, Scythe. So this, this is a very interesting <laughs> game, and this is... Uh, it has a very cool mechanism of what... I, I kind of call it like the peekaboo mechanism where <laughs> where like yeah as you move the pieces around on on your action board you get to modify what actions you take and what you can do and the bonuses and how to mitigate that back and forth this is not definitely not a light game not at um, all. but i mean it uh, both in weight and difficulty to play in length and, and length but i mean there's a reason the overall rank of it on board game geek as of when we're filming it is number 11 which is amazing but at first, when I saw this, I, I saw the mechs, and I couldn't help but think, oh, this is just a mech battle game. And and I'm very glad I played it, because that was that was wrong. <laughs> that was an incorrect assumption. 
Uh, yeah, no. Uh, Viticulture is the the <laughs> game that made me fall in love with Stonemaier, and then I played this one, and uh, it. it it made me realize how much of a company I really enjoy the games. This game, it, it yeah, it takes a little bit longer, but this is what I've really become to love and find out that I love. It adds blends Euro mechanisms with Ameritrash theme, and the 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 track. And there's a slim down version of that track. If anybody who's played Villainous can understand is the, your little guy goes to one spot you get to take the actions in that spot if you meet the requirements you can take the action on the bottom spot right. and it plays so well i enjoy it um there is now a couple expansions for it where they added like airships um mm -hmm. there's uh another expansion that just added two more expansions uh and my, my personal favorite that we want to try we just have it because of the global pandemic is the Rise of Fenris expansion, where it's a campaign, but it's just a modular campaign. So you can still play the base game without, or, or you can you can open up the boxes and play with whatever's in those boxes, or you can play it as a campaign style. And I think uh, it's going to be really intriguing to play that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I may or may not volunteer for that. We'll <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. Another incredibly big game, but not overly. I, so it starts off being a very simple game. Now, just as a recap, how many you played the one right before the yes, pandemic but, started? Yeah, right? I played the one okay. scenario and then the pandemic started. Which yeah, <laughs> which yeah, I know it's it's really neat. This he did a lot of interesting things in it, and I hope I didn't give anything away what what I was implying. And I don't think it. No, it no, was it's specific enough, enough, especially for the um, fans at home. Right, and then but when you get to that part, you're going to see what I mean. It's something that I haven't seen still in any legacy game. And there's, I wanted to ask him about one other... There's a component that he has in it that's also one that I have never seen uh, in a board game, much less a <laughs> legacy game. Um, so it was really in, intriguing. But this was his first and so far only uh, foray into legacy, and I really enjoyed it. And one of the big things about it is that it's a Euro legacy, for one. Yeah. It is a worker placement that uses uh, what's been called worker bumping, where like you could still... On your turn, you either put out a worker or you take them back. But if I if I want a spot that you're on, I can still go there. It doesn't prevent me from going there, but you get your worker back, and that gives Which you another gives you turn. Which gives turn, yeah, without having to pull up my workers. Right, and so that's that's an interesting little... like In, in a standard worker placement with resource management, you're going to think, all right, I need three of these items, one of these, one of these, yeah, and you're going to plan for that. But now the turn of what order you do that in <laughs> yeah, matters exactly. because you're going to think, all right, well... I want, well, I need that thing, and so do you. When I know he picked up that thing, and he wants it, so I'm going to go here. This way he can bump me, because I know he needs that resource, yeah. too. Yeah, and that's that's a really intriguing... Uh, I mean, this effectively converted one of our friends into... Into a legacy, into yeah. Le into agreeing that legacy was good. And now, I didn't want to say it while Jamie was on there, but I haven't played it since. Uh, well, but that's he, just because he, the group disbanded. Uh, one of the guys got deployed. Uh, he was in the National Guard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of them moved, and so... Uh, and granted, me and the, me and our mutual friend Dom, we were the ones who really ran away with it because we just had such a background in legacy, or yeah. uh, not legacy, but Euro games, that it was, I felt kind of bad for everybody else. I, I think it was just him and I who basically ran Steam each game. It. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why I, I consider this one of the better legacy games out there, or one of the more historical ones, because you got your pandemic legacy sure. that threw legacy into the world. Right. And everybody loved it. Of course, you had Risk Legacy, who I would you consider the granddaddy, but the, the one that took off was Pandemic Legacy. Charterstone has started something that you're seeing more now, and I, I we explained it with uh, Jamie Stegmaier, is that when you're done with it, you can play it again. Uh, right. You have your own unique game of Charterstone. And what, what I didn't mention, though, what else is unique about it is because there's a second side of the board. So if you buy the recharge yep. pack, yep. you could do a whole second legacy whole second of it, campaign, play it yeah. differently, and either side of the board is going to be completely different from the other. Right, which at first I was... I, at first, I was a little hesitant to that idea because it goes with like the, the newest uh, nomination for uh, Spiel de Jar, the My City one. Yeah. Um, I watched the Eric Martin uh, review of it from Board Game Geek, and he brought up some really good points. He's like, well, everything I do in this game doesn't affect the future games. And I'm not saying that's true for Charterstone necessarily, um, because it definitely affects it. But if you play it with the same group, 
I feel like you could still have just as much fun knowing some of the potential. It's like, how did I get this piece before? Mm, I really like that one. Yeah. I think I know how I'm going to approach it now. Yeah. And or, I, or even to the point where, hey, they got something that I want that ability for. Yeah. Okay, how did they do it? Let me see if I can trigger it for me this mm -hmm. time. But then on the same level, like, if, if let's say, if I played my second run through uh, with somebody who has never played it, I think they would still legitimately have a chance. Yeah. Even though, even though I know kind of what's coming up, I still have to unlock it. And, yeah. And just because I get it doesn't mean exactly. everybody else can because we're making new worker placement spots. It's really interesting to see how it plays out. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I like it a lot. This we, is, we, we this is my favorite Stonemaier game personally. All right. Let's move on. And uh, we talked about it earlier. Uh -huh. The I wouldn't say kid version but a younger audience version sure. of scythe yeah. it's a lot more friendly it's more family weight than say scythe scythe is not family weight at all so i guess that's the way to, the best way to describe it is my uh, a family weight scythe and right. that is my little scythe so instead of starting wars you start <laughs> pie fights <laughs> yeah exactly i i love that like it's they, they took an already fun game uh and themed it in a way that made a lot of sense now I think the original version was was like My Little Pony or something. It was another... It was something a, like that, yeah. Um, instead, they went with the animal mascots for each of the um, houses in Scythe. Yeah. And they Which turned them into little chibi uh, uh, characters. And it's, it's a gorgeous looking game. I have not played this one. I don't think you have either. I have not. But from everything I've read in reviews and stuff like that, it's... Um, it's a fun game. It's really good. Uh, kids and families uh, enjoy it. It's much more family friendly than, say, uh, Scythe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 it is a family weight game or a family friendly version of it. I mean, not to say that. I wouldn't say uh, Scythe is not family friendly, but I don't know, I, some I don't, of that artwork is a little <laughs> like it, the it choices that you dark. can make in Scythe. The choices where you can yeah. be like feed them or don't feed them or give right. them a little bit. It, it it can be so they it can be a little dark for say this one is recommended right. for eight and up. So it could be a little dark for the eight, nine, ten year olds. Sure, stuff like yeah. That. I think my 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 son would like this a lot, and I'm still considering buying it for him. Yeah, I've been and, wondering. And plus, pie like fights is just hilarious. And then, right. <laughs> so uh, before we move on, just to remind, uh, they just came out with its first expansions mm -hmm. uh, for this game called Pie in the Sky. You can actually get it on the Stonemeyer site if it's still there. Uh, I know he only had so much that he could sell in his shop. Right. But uh, I think stores are starting to carry it. So if you want to do like curbside pickup, you can too. Okay. Cool. Very cool. So that was my little scythe. And let's talk about the sequel to Between Two Cities. Um, and this was this was one of a couple. So he's he's done uh, work with other companies before. Yeah. The other one that I can think of off the top of my head, and the reason why we don't have it on the list is I think the other company produced it, and I, I'm forgetting to remember the name of the company, but it's Leaders of Euphoria. Yeah. It's it's like a social, social deduction. deduction version of uh, set in the Euphoria universe. universe. Yeah. And so that was interesting, but this was one that uh, Stonemeyer published. And this was working with Ted Alsbach of uh, Bezier yeah. Games. And this is called Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Now, I, I, I know Between Two Cities, and I kind of know Mad King Ludwig's story. Like, you're building the castle, right. and it's crazy how it's being built. Uh, but have, have you played uh, the castles of Mad King Ludwig? No, I have not. Okay, so... The, the idea of that is, or of course, it's based off of the Mad King Ludwig, which was actually a person in history <laughs> yeah. who was known for... It, like, he was called the Mad King, right? But he, he wasn't... I wouldn't say he was necessarily crazy. He was eccentric. Crazy. He was... Yeah, he was, he was the Oscar Wilde of, <laughs> of royal royalty, you know? Um, but no, the idea was basically he, he was known, one of his big things was making these massive, like, mansion castles that were... That had every little, everything you can imagine, and they were very extravagant and very over the top for the time, you know. Um, and now many of his castles are still found. Yeah. Uh, and you can still look into the history a lot about it. And so this took that theme of basically what made it interesting is every tile could score in different ways. Like it might have, it might give you points for rooms that it was connected to. Like if it was a loud music hall, then you don't want you know, residences next to it. You don't yeah. want people sleeping because they don't keep them up. Yeah. You know, uh, you don't want 
like like things that are supposed to be underground next next to opening to like the air and stuff, <laughs> yeah. or like dungeons and stuff. You don't really want that being near an opening oh. or an outdoor thing. So that it took a lot of those scoring things uh, and mechanisms of different ways to score, and I think implemented into between two cities. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting. Um, I do want to get a copy of this one as well. I want both between two cities and between two castles. Yeah. Um, I love the mechanism in this game. I think it's uh, one of the coolest mechanisms in a game. And it's so different. Like, you, you're working with your neighbors and when you're drafting, stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I really do enjoy this game. Um, not this one, but between two cities. But I think I would enjoy this one as well just because of that mechanism. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think you would like castles of Mac. I'll have to bring that over too yep. as well. So the next one on our list is the the biggest. Uh, honestly, he even said it: the biggest game that Stone Myers sold. Yeah, it is almost. Uh, it's half a million copies sold. That is wow. just. And this game came out last year, folks. Yeah, twenty nineteen. The yeah, it was the beginning of twenty nineteen, but it sold five hundred thousand in less than a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. That that means that it's selling about a thousand copies a day. Yeah, it's just amazing. Uh, what this done and again it, 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 it's it's interesting to see and this is what i was talking about and he's talking about it he talked about it earlier too with elizabeth hargrave this game put her on the map and now everybody is right. like okay so tussie musty took off a little bit not as big as wingspan but right. what will but a lot of pre-orders for mariposas mm -hmm. um and he said it's so interesting and light that he enjoyed it, it right so what she's done for the gaming community with this and it's it's funny that I look at this and a lot of people, they hate it for the theme, but I've seen more people actually love it for the theme. They're like, <laughs> yeah, it's cool, right. but it's a bird theme. And I'm like, for me personally, yeah, it's cool, but it's a bird theme. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. different. And, and you know how little or how much I enjoy unique themes? Like this one didn't necessarily captivate me, but I'm, I've never, I've never been upset when we've played this. Yeah. I've all, I have enjoyed it um, just about every time we have played it and it's because I, I think what Jamie Stegmeier did as far as his development work you can see his style of games yeah. really being hashed out in these mechanisms if you take a very simple turn effectively but the ability to expand on it the like, I, I'm sure that was part of his, his thing is how well it can build this yeah. engine and you have such fluidity moving throughout it. it and it's how, really the, neat. how the engine itself works with each other. So how one, like if you want to build in the forest, you need to get uh, use a, uh, what is it, something like, to get extra cards, or was it extra from the bird feeder, you give rid of, I can't remember, like a card or something like that. And the one below it works with food, right. and the one below that works with, um, what is it? Uh, eight. Oh, the terrain, yeah. yeah. So how they all work with each other, like, hey, you can get rid of this to get an extra of this when you're in that certain point in the, the track when you start with your pieces. And I really dig it because of the components in it, too. It's a yeah. very beautifully produced game. Yeah, the eggs could be one color, but it, they just pop more now that they're different colors. Right. Um, the, the art on the board. The art on the board. The wooden dice. Uh, I'm not a huge, huge fan of wooden dice, but this it one... Wouldn't have made, it, it wouldn't have worked with yeah. plastic. The wooden dice make sense because they're birds. Most birds live in trees. Yeah, it's more natural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the <laughs> fact that the it's a birdhouse for the dice. Yeah. Track. He didn't need to do that, but, no, but I'm glad he did. Yeah, it's so yeah. beautifully produced. And the thing that I really, really like about this game is the artwork. Because yeah. it looks like you're reading actually one of those bird books yeah. um, that birders read. The National, oh, I think it's the Audubon Society books and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, my, like I said, my uncle, it was a bird watcher, and he he gave me some of those books, and I would read them, and I would learn about birds as a kid. And to this, this, this gives me that connection of hanging out with my uncle, uh, who's still alive, but I just don't see him all that much because he lives in Houston. And, right. But just having that connection to birds because of him, and I want to show him this game. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, it, it's interesting how well it was able to bring on non-gamers, considering it's not the lightest game. Yeah. You know, and, and Jamie kind of said it, too, is like it, it, it's, it's accessible because of the theme. And it's not a and, and it's mechanism, not tricky. Um, right. It's learn. a simple game. Yeah. You do one of four actions, get some eggs, draw some cards or make a bird or or play a bird card or um, get food. Yeah, That's and then it. everything has a cost of some sort. You yeah. want to play a bird, you pay the food. 
you got to put it somewhere. You also got to pay an egg. It's it's real simple. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't consider it a gateway game because it no. is a little bit more uh, involved than, say, a gateway game. But That's I consider it a next step. Yep. It's like just right above gateway game. So when you get someone to play Ticket to Ride, oh, you like that? Here, let's try this. Right. Yeah. You're ready for something that has a couple little, couple little tweaks little to tweaks it. tweaks to but it, but it's still simple enough. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But then they're going to be very surprised at how well it can expand. Yeah. Uh, beautiful game. Beautifully done. Uh, one of my favorite games... No. So a lot of people go through this with like terraforming Mars and this one because they're both engine builders. For me right. personally, I played this one just because it's so much. I, I love terraforming Mars. You know yeah. I love terraforming. Mm -hmm. It's just so much simpler. Like I'll, I'll play terraforming Mars with gamers who are really into that Euro right. mechanism. This one I can play with family and they'll enjoy it. And this one, so many awards and nominations, it's not even funny. Oh, and we we just had one of our regulars. Uh, Come on in. Thank you for joining us, Sith3. Yeah, oh, talking about Wingspan. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Sleek AF. <laughs> yeah, it, it's neat. Yeah, it's a really it's a really smart uh, mechanism. Now, we normally, during the breakdowns, we forgot to do this. We normally bring up the awards that they won, yeah. but this is definitely the one that we have to talk, about, talk about, is the Kenner Spiel. That, that's the biggest that's the award. That's game. Uh, so, when the, we're talking about like uh, board gaming in general, the, the Spiel de Jahres is one of the bigger ones because that's more of the family game yeah. of the year. Right. The Kinderspiel is the game of the year, in yeah. essence, for the more, them or not thematic, but uh, strategic game of the year, I guess you can say. Right, exactly. Yeah, this is one of those ones where it, if we didn't bring up that this was, uh, that this even the fact that it won, uh, you know, won golden... <laughs> The it Golden, the Golden Geek Board Ge Game of the Year. Game of the Year, most innovative board game of the year. Best strategy, uh, solo. Yeah. So it it's, was. It wasn't just big here in America with the Golden Geek. It was big over in Europe too. It went right. in the Kennerspiel. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that, the Netherlands too. Yep, Netherlands. Yeah, we we couldn't be more happy for him that that this was. That it it, it makes me feel bad that he's such a nice guy. <laughs> that it's like I want I want to have a reason to hate you, and I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. No, no, he he's, he's super really cool. a nice guy, and and I'm glad that this worked out that well for him. Yeah, you know, this is um, it's putting them on the map, and it's going to continue to do so. Uh, let's talk about the next one, the 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 most recent big boy, as we call it. Uh, it this is tapestry, and this is actually one of your favorite stone. This things. is probably my second favorite. I I enjoyed the mess out of it. I've only played it once, but when I played it, I, I cannot describe to you how how interesting I really do think that, that mechanism is. So the board has four tracks, and you're at the start of each track. All you do on your turn is move a piece up ahead on the track, and I mean, with, with some exceptions, but that's really what you're doing on your turn. You move it ahead, you get the benefit, you pay the cost for it, and it's incredibly simple, but man, is it immersive. It is. Everything works differently. The buildings that you build on your map is interesting. Um, you know, the all of the different civilizations are, are different. You know, how you put things out. I just, I really, really did think that this, this is one of the most innovative mechanisms I've, I've seen. And so the big thing about this one, though, is... This is also one of his most controversial games. Uh, there was a lot of issues with it because some people thought the, the civilizations weren't play tested, and he's done a 2.0 for the civilizations mm -hmm. for random starts and stuff like that. Right. Uh, people. Another big thing is that they they're like, this is not a civilization game because it doesn't take six hours to play it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but who says it has to? Though? Yeah, like that's that's the argument. To like me, the... my thing is, it is a civilization game into the aspect that you do have civilizations. There's different things going on, yeah. but it's also different. It's more of an engine builder meets a civilization game. Yeah, uh, and I like that. I love that concept of it, and it's it's fun to play. I do enjoy it, and it's one of the most gorgeous games that he's produced those pre-painted minis that come mm -hmm. with it yeah. are just so nice i can understand one of the complaints is that they don't fit right on the board like they yeah, should exactly perfect but but I, yeah. I almost wonder if that would if that would work though like it it, it kind of does people mind, are uh making 3d printed uh clips and right. player colors this way they can put it on there and then they'll fit in those squares like they're supposed oh, to. oh i see okay because i i just feel like it would bump the other pieces if, yeah if it was so. that way. but either way i mean it's 
that's a small minor thing. One thing that I think is really, really innovative with this is the fact that he used like um, a roughing texture on, on the, the playmat. This way, play the cards mats. don't slide. Yeah, because I, you're gonna be playing um, cards onto the thing right. for abilities and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and that's for that era. That's a that's a very interesting take on that. Like that, like finding something as simple as like how w what are the constraints what would take us out of the experience well bumping a board and then the card shifting around yeah that's totally something that would happen but everybody else would say well don't bump the board yeah you know but, th I mean, but that's not a solution at, right if you remember a uh, tabletop episode of tick to ride when his wife hit the table and everything just exploded <laughs> and everything flew everywhere right <laughs> so this is just a way for him to uh negate that help it anyways this way if someone hit the table things are still going to fall apart but right and i think a big part of it too is those minis are like a soft rubbery plastic rather mm -hmm. than a yeah. uh uh a hard plastic so they, right. they have more of a grip to them for they can yep. stay better on the boards especially the ones that you actually put on the boards yeah the, the ones, territories. like they're top heavy i i don't see them fall over they yeah do, unless you turn them over yeah you right have you, to have to, being you have to yeah. force <laughs> you have to force it over yeah no tapestry i i enjoy this a lot i think it's anybody who has an argument like uh, we've heard the arguments first like the the one argument that i hear is or one of the main ones is that it's a civilization game that's short good yeah. <laughs> yeah like that's not that's not a detriment to the game that's the point he wasn't trying to make a yeah, civilization he, game he that doesn't was four want hours long, long games and if you actually ever go to his website mm -hmm. or his blog post he'll actually tell you the the, right. the the tenets of what he wants for his board game exactly they have to hold up to this many players they have to do so much here they cannot right. overstay their welcome and stuff like that and i think exactly. that's amazing because he knows what he wants to do yeah yeah i couldn't agree more um, and then the other complaint is that technically they were off balance. Some of the yeah. some of the civilizations, which they weren't play tested well. They weren't play tested well. Which, uh, like, I the best argument against that that I've heard one was from Rado, and so he, Rado has a background in video game. Yeah, and so he's developed video games. That in order to balance that many against each other, would you would have to do an obscene amount of yeah. playtesting like a, a, a ridiculous amount which uh honestly like it's i don't think that's a fair assessment but the fact that he's willing to go back and do erratas to it yeah that's already awesome i heard uh the dice tower guys talking about what what he could do differently and he was and they proposed an idea where they thought it would be interesting if in the next expansion having redone civilization cards and they're like, wow, yeah, that's pretty much the best way he could do it, you know? Because yeah. reprinting it and, sell it and sending those for free, no, that's unreasonable. Putting stickers on the board, that's unreasonable. You know, uh, like making people purchase from it, they'll be they'll be upset. But if you include those along with an expansion that does more stuff, yeah. and if you really care that much, then that would be an interesting outlet and to do it. My, and that's all speculation. Yeah, Who and then my thing with the people when they were complaining about the overpowered of the thing he even says there's some that are better for people who are new to the style of game and right. there's some for like the people who like to game the game and there's also some that are situationally better yeah, yeah. like it depending on and like, how you want to play do you want to play militaristically and conquer then that's good for right. that situation you're only going to really want to concentrate on that track and the thing that i liked and we haven't mentioned it on this one is how the tracks that are opposite play well with each other. Right. So the military yeah. goes really well with the exploration track, yep. and the science track goes really well with the technology track. Yeah, yeah. I I couldn't agree more. It's it's really neat how well that works. Ah, I kind of want to play this again. <laughs> I'm looking at your copy. I want to play it again. We'll have to do that sometime for yeah. time. It, it was really cool. All right, and then we're gonna talk pretty quickly about this this newer one. It's not really published by him. Um, it's called Rolling Realms. I mean, it, it is it's published a by him. But print and play that he made of yeah. nine of his realms. <laughs> right. I I remember. So uh, this is gonna sound like I'm gonna toot my own horn for a minute there, but I I remember like the first week um, of the of the lock the stay at home orders. I was thinking of the, which was partly the inspiration for making the podcast here. I was thinking, what is a way to still be gamers? and still game in this time and the first thing is first video chat interactivity yeah and secondly would be multiplayer games either online or print and play or roll and rights and so i uploaded like one of my card games as a free print and play on the board game geek saying hey here have it yeah. anybody can download it 
uh, play it if you want, you know, and then order it if you like it. That'd be cool. But it's, I want you to play games. And then, like, not just, like, a few days later, Jamie Stegmaier started talking about Rolling Realms, and I love how he engaged his audience in the development of it. Yeah, and then the thing about it is he would do it during the week where he'd be like, okay, we're going to play this. Yeah. Here's 2.0. Now here's 3.0. Here's what mm-hmm. I fixed. Here's what's new. And he was doing that with his audience. Yeah. Yeah. And and so different iterations changed as, as far as that went. And that was, and he never, he never asked for any money. He was like, all right, anybody can play it. Here's a print and play version of it. And yeah. he explained how it worked and, and he would actively engage with the audience. And I was, I was part of one of those groups and it was really in, enjoyable you know and i like the fact that he was willing to do that yeah and that that says like because other people have made like print and play versions of the games some people made made roll and rights more accessible some uploaded their games on like tabletopia tabletop sim board game arena there's others that made like um print and play expansions like detective was a big one portal games was releasing a lot of expansions for Detective. right yeah and but just the fact that he was that he just sat down with the audience and was like, all right, guys, let's just play this. Let's see what happens. It may or may not work. And and hearing his thoughts from a design perspective, I thought fit not only well with his with his blog and vlogs, but also just, I, I mean, that's just solidified. Like, it, this is just a cool guy, you know? <laughs> so I, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, it's it, it's a really neat game. I haven't played it yet, but I've lo- watched him play it online. I think it really looks cool because you're only mm-hmm. playing what three of the civilizations, or uh, yeah, per round. So yeah, you're, the whole game you end up playing all nine of the civilizations, but you'll either pick like rows or columns. And so, for example, if I pick uh, between two cities, wingspan, and my little scythe, you're going to be playing this this collection of games for the first round. Okay. And then you're marking off the resources as you gain them. Then you mark your total score, and then you go back and then play the next ones. So you're going to play all nine games, is what you're saying? Basically, yeah. yeah okay. And they're all mini, truncated versions that take a little factor from, <laughs> from each game. From from each one. My my favorite would probably be, and this is going to be ironic, it was probably Between Two Cities. <laughs> and, and I like how it did it, because you would put the numbers here, and then depending on how much... I wonder if I can zoom in a little bit on this. Uh, well, that made it smaller. Okay, that didn't help. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you would put the numbers down here, and and depending on which number or which ones would be filled in and what numbers you'd get, you'd get the resources here. Although, actually, I like tapestry a lot, too, because that's very akin to a lot of... You're, you're filling in the shapes based on the numbers. Yeah. And so that, depending on how many rows and or blocks of rows and columns you get, you get points for that. So that's really cool. Um, I think maybe we should play one of these on live stream one time. Uh, Absolutely. If, I can, if yeah. I can get my printer to work, that's the big thing is I need printed. Uh, I have a printer. It is not in color at the moment, and it <laughs> might yell at me for it, but I can try my best, and we'll we'll definitely play it. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, and the thing I like about it is he's very open with his his fe- right. uh, his company. He's yeah. very easy to approach. Um, all we had to do was just request and he was more than willing to come onto the show and talk with us he's his time's limited because he's got a lot going sure, on yeah but um and the thing is he's very easy to communicate with and he's such a nice guy honestly and yeah. i'm a huge fan of his game so i tried every chance of being at the fangirl a little bit here <laughs> <laughs> yeah no and, and so we want to give one more shout out to jamie thank you so much for joining us um if you want if you enjoyed this episode please consider subscribing to our youtube channel uh, uh, YouTube Everyday Board Games 2020, as well as the audio versions will be found on Everyday Board Games 2020 on Podbean. Awesome! And if you ever want to watch us live and join in on the discussion, uh, we tend to troubleshoot a little bit, but that's <laughs> you know it's just part of the part of the deal. You can check us out at twitchtv games. and you can also contact us at Everyday Board Games 2020 at gmail.com. And the just to know when we troubleshoot, that's the problem when we do it live. Yeah, yeah, that's that's part of doing live. Thankfully, we can edit all that out, yeah. even though I think we leave it in mostly. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, <laughs> it's funnier that way. Um, so we want to thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for joining in on the conversation. And uh, we hope you enjoyed. the uh, This upcoming week, we will be on Wednesday, we will be talking about uh, our weekly chits and giggles. And we're going to be talking about uh, combining games. And this is... 
uh, each of our places will have two games that we would like to see combined in a different way. Yeah. Um, like, so, for example, uh, well, I don't want to give an example, but, like... My, mine's really simple. Let's just pick two right off. Uh, Dead of Winter and uh, Deception. Like, if we could find... If we think that that would work. Actually, that would kind of work. You're, you're basically <laughs> trying to find out the traitor. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> Who's true. the one that murried, m murdered the mayor at the gas station? <laughs> right, exactly. Well, I hope I didn't give you an answer right there. But two different games that we think would fit well, either thematically or mechanistically... Um, uh, that'd be cool. Yeah, a lot of mine tends to be like, I really like this mechanism and I want to blend it with this theme because it works so well. Um, sure. And so, uh, just because that's the best way for me to combine things, is yeah. blending a mechanism with a theme. Yeah, yeah, totally. Alright, so we hope you enjoyed that. Uh, we don't yet have Friday's Top 8 Debate or ready yet. Or Monday's, uh, next week's or next Game week's. Breakdown. So, so we'll get that taken care of very soon. But thank you for tuning in. As always, I've been Daniel. And I've been Daniel. And we want to thank you for watching Everyday Board Games. Have a good one.